acknowledges success through global cooperation. Yes, now we are here for the same purpose. Now I honorably welcome Dr. Prahalad, distinguished scientist, our chief guest. Please to come over the stage. Please put your hands to Dr. Prahalad. <laughs> to speak about him, it is really honor. Dr. Prahalad is a mechanical engineer, graduated from Bangalore University in 1969, an Emmy in Aeronautic Engineer from ISC Bangalore, PhD in Mechanical Engineer from Jawaharlal Nehru Technology University, Hyderabad. Since 1971, he has served in various ISRO and DRDO establishment covered USSC, Trivandrum, ADE, Bangalore, DRDL, Hyderabad. His area of interest covers fights, control, guidance, system design, and system engineering, etc., etc. Since November 2005, as a chief controller, research and development at DRDO headquarters, and distinguished development scientist. He is heading service interactions, international cooperation, foreign offices from UK, USA, and Russia. He has received many prestigious awards and honors. Few of them are, he has received DRDO Scientist of the Year, HMA Member of the Year, IISC Distinguished Award, National Aeronautic Prize, Shivananda Eminent Citizen Award of 2008 by Sanatana Dharma Charitable Trust, Hyderabad. He is the winner of DRDO Award for the Pathbreaking Research of Outstanding Technology Development, 2008. He is received of Lifetime Achievement Award, 2010 by Hyderabad Management Association. He was awarded honorary doctorate from Sri Venkateshwara University in 2006. He, is, he was the chairman of steering committee of organizing the first World Congress on Disaster Management 2008 in Hyderabad. Also the chairman for the second World Congress on Disaster Management scheduled in 2010. About 30 countries and 10 UN organizations participated in this, which was inaugurated by APG Abdul Kalam. He is a fellow Indian National Academy of Engineering. He has been associated with so many associations and serving from so many years. Please put your hands to Dr. Prahalad. Good afternoon. After a good inauguration and a probably a good lunch, we are having a, going to we are having a session, taking session. We have three important speakers in this session, and the first speaker today is Mr. Anand Mahindra. I will briefly introduce Mr. Anand Mahindra. He is currently the vice chairman and managing director of Mahindra and Mahindra. He is one of the India's largest, most respected business. Business uh, houses, and uh, whoever has travelled in Scorpio you know, appreciates Aran Mahindra. He's his baby, and after graduating from Harvard and earning his MBA from the Harvard Business School, he returned to India and joined Mahindra Yogin Steel Company, and uh, he was an executive assistant to the finance director. He rose to become president and deputy managing director in 1989. During his stint, he initiated a number of uh, diversification programs into new business areas of real estate and hospitality management. In 1991, he was appointed Deputy Managing Director of Mahindra and Mahindra, the you know, flagship company of the Mahindra Group, and the country's dominant producer of vehicles, off-road vehicles, agricultural tractors. In 1997, he was appointed uh, Managing Director of Mahindra and Mahindra, and ja in January 9, 2003, he was given additional responsibility as the vice chairman. His focus has been 
driving comprehensive change program that has transformed the company and the group into efficient, aggressive competitor in the new liberalized economic environment in India. He is a past president of CII, Automotive Research Association of India. He is on the board of National Stock Exchange of India. He is a member of the board of trustees of Asia Society in New York. He is a member of the advisory committee of Harvard University Asia Center. He takes a lot of interest in education and is presently on the governing board of several educational initiatives in the country. Mr. Mahindra is the recipient of numerous national and international awards, including Rajiv Gandhi Award for Outstanding Contribution in the Business, 2005 Leadership Award from American India Foundation, CNBC Asia Business Leader Award for the year 2006, Most Inspiring Corporate Leader of the year 2007 by NDTV Profit, Businessman of the year 2007 from Business India, Harvard Business School Alumni Achievement Award 2008, CNBC Outstanding Business Leader of the Year 2009, Business Leader of the Year 2009 by Economic Times, Ernst and Young Entrepreneur of the Year in 2009, and Indian of the Year 2009 by NDTV. So every year he has been in limelight as business leader, innovator, and entrepreneur. So here is Mr. An Mahindra. Thank you, Dr. Prahlad, Honorable Minister, Dr. Saraswat. Ladies and gentlemen, I must remind my secretary to give a very brief biodata from now on. I'm glad you made me stand here because I realize how onerous it is to have a long introduction while you're standing on the side. So I will be shorter next time. I want to begin on perhaps a somewhat serious note. Uh, I just felt it might be appropriate for me to ex express my condolences to the families of the two airmen, the pilots of the helicopter that were ferrying a craft to the air show and perished on the way. We are a country of over a billion people, but I believe we care for every life. And since they were on the way to support the air show, I would like to extend my deepest condolences to their families. My heart goes out to them, to Captain Bhanu Pratap Gupta and Major Atul Garje. Now this is um, supposed to be a conclave of experts. And the great scientist Niels Bohr once defined an expert as a man who has made all the mistakes that can be made in his field. Now I still make plenty of mistakes, so by by that definition, I'm not an expert, even at our core businesses of autos and tractors, let alone aerospace. Although, there is also a saying that the person who makes no mistakes makes nothing at all. And by that definition, I'd probably prefer to remain a non-expert. But I am surrounded today, and I acknowledge that, by a, a great gathering of aerospace expertise. And when I started thinking about this keynote address that I was invited to deliver, I found myself wondering why I, as a self-proclaimed non-expert, have been asked and what I can contribute. So I finally decided that the best service I could render here today would be to capitalize on the fact that I am not an expert and just speak as a plain, blunt man someone who loves his country and wants to see that country take its place, its rightful place in the global aerospace arena. So over the next few minutes, what I'd like to do is to share my perspectives on the changing landscape of the global aerospace industry, the opportunities that this opens up for India, and the fundamental shifts in thinking that we need to engineer in order to obtain what I believe is our rightful share of these opportunities. Now, India is poised to become a major consumer of global aerospace and defense products. And from now on, I'll, for convenience, refer to aerospace and defense as A&D. So Indian A&D procurements are estimated to be upwards of 100 billion U.S. dollars over the next decade. 
And that's just the estimated defense spend. There's also the projected spend on civilian aircraft. As you all know, Indigo Airlines made a big splash recently with its 180 aircraft order. And at current estimates, Indian operators are expected to spend a further $130 billion on civilian airliner purchases over the next two decades. These figures don't include the untapped potential for air transportation to underserved Tier 3 and Tier 4 areas of the country. They don't even include the growing demand for business jets and general aviation. So the procurement picture, I think, ladies and gentlemen, is very clear. India is going to be a very, very big spender. My question today is, is that all that we want to be? Are we, can, are we content to remain eternal consumers? Or do we want to take charge of our own destiny and move from being global consumers to becoming global producers as well? If we want to, then I think the opportunity is knocking. It's knocking loud and knocking hard. So let's take a look at what's happening in the global A&D industry to, to understand exactly how large this opportunity is. There are really three distinct trends at play globally. Let me, for convenience, call them the three Ps. Partnership, participation, and proper procurement. The first trend of, part, of partnership. Now, globally, the industry has evolved from vertically integrated aircraft companies that used to do everything themselves to partnership models where Tier 1 and Tier 2 suppliers not only supply components, but they also become risk-sharing partners. So globally, no one goes it alone anymore. And there is a huge potential for partnership and therefore great opportunities for Indian companies. The second trend of participation has arisen because there's no longer a one-way street of one party selling and the other party buying. Not just individual companies, but national interests are increasingly engaging in a form of barter, swapping large purchases of A&D products for in-country production work shares and other sourcing. Now, this is not necessarily only through an offset policy. Whether it's major assemblies for the Boeing 787 being made in Japan or final assembly of Airbus aircraft in China, the reality is that countries making large, expensive A&D purchases also want to sell products and services in return. And when I think of the potential spends from India that I just enumerated and the influence it would give us, I naturally hunger for that something in return, those opportunities that I believe will open up for India. The third trend of procurement. Now, the old model of technology products flowing from mature markets to emerging markets has succumbed to global competition and cost pressures. While A&D producers are still overwhelmingly based in Europe and North America, they're increasingly providing, or procuring rather, goods and services from lower cost geographies to gain a competitive edge in the marketplace. So again, this is an opportunity, a huge opportunity for a country with frugal engineering skills. So the old uh, bard Shakespeare famously said that there is a tide in the affairs of men, which when taken at the flood leads on to fortune, but omitted. All the voyage of their lives is bound in shallows and in miseries. If you look at these global trends, there is a tide coming. And it certainly could lead on to fortune. The question is, are we ready to take it? To do that, we have to be ready to join an increasingly globalized industry where old and new economies are forging very vibrant two-way relationships, where new aircraft programs are widely dispersed, not concentrated anymore, 
and they're all multinational activities and these are activities where emerging economies like Brazil and China are, are already establishing themselves as major producers so are we here figuring out ways and means to do this or will our journey remain bound in shallows and miseries to use Shakespeare's phrase I personally am confident that we can seize this opportunity we have superb institutions like HAL the crown jewel of the Indian aircraft industry its prowess in the art and science of aircraft development its ability to engineer innovative products and its top grade production facilities all weigh in on the credit side of India's balance sheet. MRO, HAL is an aeronautical powerhouse that provides the nation with end-to-end -end domestic capability for a remarkable variety of aviation needs. And shifting from aircraft to spacecraft, ISRO has steadily built up a remarkable portfolio of capabilities in remote sensing, in communications, communication satellites, and launch vehicles. And these giants are complemented by the Defense R&D Organization, DRDO, the National Aerospace Laboratories of the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, on whose board I am privileged to serve, and India's academic institutions, all of which play key roles in technology development and R&D. We started with providing MRO services during World War II, and today we make our own light combat aircraft and provide commercial space launch services globally. So frankly, it's been an inspiring journey. But these great institutions, because of their vital importance to the national interest, must, of necessity, focus the bulk of their energies domestically. They cater to an inward focus. What about the external focus with its host of very, very attractive opportunities? Is it possible for these institutions to expand some part of their bandwidth to this external focus? Can India become a producer and exporter as well as a consumer? And as I said earlier, I believe we can if public institutions and private companies come together to exploit the size and the scale of this opportunity but I have to admit one thing as I said I'm going to be blunt the private sector today is far from being the effective partner it should be PricewaterhouseCoopers noted in a 2009 survey that the Indian private sector is globally competitive in design engineering in IT and ITES and in non aerospace manufacturing but has yet to make its mark in the aerospace domain. Consultants A.T. Kearney observed that most Indian private players in A&D are relatively small and operate at a tier three level, making individual parts and very small components. And many of them are domestically focused, not exporting their products into the global A&D supply chain. So the private sector clearly lacks today scope as well as scale. But we at Mahindra believe that the current state of the private sector is a glass half full. It's an opportunity, not an obstacle. And we think that three things have to happen to transform our industry into a vibrant participant in the global A&D network. First, we have to use the offset policy wisely. The offset policy in its progressive incarnations is a fundamental game changer. It's a very powerful mechanism to ensure that large purchases from abroad are matched by large spends domestically. And it certainly is opening up a new way of doing business, leading to partnerships, to co-investments, to joint development plans. The offset situation is creating a flood, and our industries are positioning themselves to surf these waters to growth and prosperity. But really the danger is that the flood could drown us rather than allow us a platform for surfing. Because by itself the offset policy could well blunt our competitive edge. Because guaranteed business always lulls one into a 
complacency that is illusory. So I believe that the offset policy is only an enabler and not an end in itself. If we are smart, we are going to use this as a stepping stone to become part of a global supply chain. And this means that we should not, under any circumstances, be seduced by the offset clause, but instead use it smartly to build capabilities that are going to become building blocks for long-term productivity. The second element that we have to manage smartly is technology development, which is the engine that's going to drive growth into the high-tech A&D sector. Now, our nation has, rightly, up to now, maintained a strong policy of self-reliance not least because of our geopolitical situation. And this has led, undoubtedly, to some very inspiring achievements. But with the globalization of the A&D industry, perhaps the time has come now to balance this self-reliance imperative with an opportunity to participate in this increasingly globalized industry. We have to ensure that we not only get the best of current technology, but that also we are in the loop for future technologies that will determine future competitiveness. And I believe that in order to address these issues, we must broaden our goal from being simply transfer of technology to technology co-creation. That has to be our mantra. And this has many advantages. By becoming co-developers of future technology, we immediately establish our utility in the global supply chain. We enhance our own capability to generate future technologies and simultaneously ensure that we are not left behind by the growth in technology. So we will shift from being receivers to partners. And that's a very, very important mind shift. Part of an overall network and not just some isolated node at the end of a one-way street. And the price, of course, for this is that we have to be increasingly collaborative. And that does, cause, that does call for a very, very different mind shift. This is really the way for us to leapfrog technology. And we can step up to bat as legitimate co-creators because we have, in various fields of technology, established a reputation globally for being competent, for being frugal, but certainly competent engineers. The third thing is that we must move towards increased public-private partnerships that I referred to earlier. Now, the public sector has clearly given India its current high stature in the world's A&D landscape, and I do not detract from that. Historically, the focus has been on self-reliance, building up domestic capability to meet India's needs. And the private sector involvement, as a result, today in India, is far lower than global industry levels. As we gear ourselves up to the, exploit the opportunities of a globalized marketplace, I believe we need to think much, much harder about how to use public and private sector capabilities for this wider purpose. Now, we think that the answer is for the domestic industry to mirror, to reflect the distributed responsibilities of global industry. Clearly, we respect the strategic importance of a strong public sector role in the aerospace industry. But we also do believe that it is time for our private sector to grow beyond the domestic-focused Tier 3 capability and aspire to a larger share of the work in A&D production. Global experience has shown that strategic partnerships across multiple businesses work. Global experience shows that extensive collaboration results in greater innovation. And so we would benefit from adopting this model domestically. And I believe this can be achieved through strong risk-sharing private-public partnerships, where responsibilities for the program definition, development, and ultimate success all these are shared between the private and public sectors. We are walking this talk. We at Mahindra have embraced this model for the five-seater light aircraft program, which we are privileged to partner with NAL for. 
And we've experienced the benefits of this partnership. And we've experienced it by changing the way we do business domestically. So at the Mahindra Group, we believe that we as private sector players can play the most beneficial role, once again, in three broad areas. Design engineering services, aerostructure manufacture, and utility aircraft. And in each of these areas, we have put our money where our mouth is. In design engineering, we have moved up from providing design support services to taking responsibility for complete design packages. And we are now getting into the certification aspect of design for OEMs. So this will lead us, in effect, to becoming design partners rather than just engineering service providers. In aerostructure manufacturing, our aspiration is to develop aerostructure designed to build capability that can bring India more tightly into the global aerospace supply chain. We want to develop a manufacturing capability that can cater to multiple product lines. And in pursuance of this, we have acquired aerostructure manufacturing capabilities in Australia. And those facilities will move into India in the course of this year. Our third area of focus is the burgeoning light utility turboprop market. And we plan to develop and market a portfolio of light aircraft in this market segment, which is also going to serve the need for better service connect surface connectivity for India's isolated rural areas. Now, I don't plan to give away any more strategic secrets here, but I will say that we have set in motion our plans for each one of these areas, all aimed at contributing to a much larger role for Indian industry in the global aerospace business, as well as to the development of the ecosystem and infrastructure domestically. So ladies and gentlemen, there was an old wise man who once said that there are three kinds of people. People who make things happen, people who watch things happen, and then people who wonder how things happened. At the Mahindra Group, we have never looked back in either puzzlement or regret at how things happened. And neither have we watched things happen. We have actively tried to make things happen. And we intend to do that here, but we will need to work together. And we're going to need to think differently along with you. We're going to need to take calculated risks. Uh, the tide that Shakespeare wrote about, and I alluded to, is high, and the current runs strongly in our favor. I'm optimistic, as I've always been, that if we believe in ourselves, if we take the longer view, if we match the effort to this opportunity, then we can ride that tide to fortune. Thank you very much.